today we're gonna do our lecture on world under 10 girls champion, Rochelle Wu from the state with the hotbed of chess activity, Alabama. And uh, her dad is a professor in, in Birmingham, I think. Well, my friend's tour, Rachel's lives in Tuscaloosa. It's unfortunate. Somebody has to live there. And Rochelle plays chess almost every weekend. Her USCF rating has been over 2,000 for a while. She's 10 years old. Um, current world champion uh, from Soviet Georgia. And she plays a lot in Atlanta area and the Charlotte area, but not so often in Atlanta for obvious reasons. Okay. And if they ever get to learn how to read in Alabama, they might get a chess book and get some chess going there. I said, if, okay. And I'm not telling them they have to do that. So no way, who did they vote for in Alabama? All right. So it's coincidentally, uh, these games were all from the world cadet, which finished last month, which Rochelle won and didn't lose any games. I believe she had eight wins and three draws, but if I'm wrong, she had seven wins and four draws. It's one of them. You guys can look it up and complain on the internet later. The only thing you're good at, you're not even good at that. Okay, terrible. All right. So uh, this was a game she played. She has the black pieces. Rochelle likes to play wild and crazy uh, rock'em sock'em chess, checkmate her opponent, tactics, tricks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mainly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The other stuff I was just kidding. Okay, so she plays the king's Indian. She has the black pieces. And she plays a very aggressive way. A lot of people who are lower rated always put their knight on d7, but knight's a little more active on c6. And then she plays the move g5 and knight fd7. And this is very interesting. I think maybe once or twice in my career, uh, when I'm white in the king's Indian, I've had somebody play knight fd7 and then try to just crush me. Um, I think once I won and once I got crushed. So knight fd7, normally in the king's Indian, when you want to move your h pawn, I'm sorry, your f pawn, the pawn on f7, and your knight is obviously in the way, you play knight h5, sometimes you take the bishop and you play you know, all your pawns forward. Um, I think this idea is interesting because Black decides, I don't want to take this bishop and trade my knight. I want to trap the bishop. Okay, it's a more aggressive idea. And the knight on d7 protects e5. So it's sort of hard for white to stop f5 and e5. And white doesn't really have great counterplay on the queen side. So it's not so easy to play here for black, for white, I should say. And I think this idea of knight fd7 was one of the ideas by the, the coach that we had in Georgia for Rochelle, John Fedorowicz. And many of you remember John Fedorowicz. When I say many of you, at least one of you. And uh, he's a New York grandmaster, uh, lives, recently married actually to the woman that he's been married to anyway for 25 years. They decided to get married for real. Um, in fact, I'm getting married soon, possibly before this video is shown based on what I'm hearing from Ben Simon. Remember, send hate mail to Ben Simon. He won't delete that out either because he likes that. Um, so I might be a married man when you see this. So very suspicious. Then I'll have many more jokes to make. So that's good for you at home. OK, so knight fd7 and black's just going to push all of her pawns forward and crush white. Let's see what white does about that. c3, solid, f5, the, uh, the point, h3, ugh. You know, I don't really know what to suggest for white. White's playing really solid. But this idea of black playing e5 and f4, that's annoying. Okay? And I know annoying because I'm getting married for the third time. So, <laughs> so I, I'm not really annoyed right now. But when you watch this video, then there's going to be some good stuff. So if I was white here, I would be very upset. Because when I play lines with white that involve bishop g5 or bishop f4, and they're playing g5 and they're doing stuff, usually my opponents play knight h5 and take my bishop. So I don't lose my bishop or get it trapped. Here I'd be very upset because if my opponent plays e5, f4, that's not good. And even if I save my bishop by playing h3, bishop h2, what kind of bishop is that on h2? Terrible. So these are the kind of games I lost a long time ago. And then by not playing very often, I lose less. I did pretty good. Okay, so h3, e5. 
Again, Rochelle likes to mix it up. Not only am I trying to win and trap this bishop, I'm currently threatening a fork of these two pieces. Although that might not work as a bishop c4 check, but it might work. d5 attacking the knight, knight to e7. And I don't really see the counterplay for white. I just see that black has a big attack. Now, after the move e4, I remember looking at this game. I was like looking over Fedorowicz's shoulder. Wait, he's pretty big. I was looking over Rochelle's shoulder. And we were in the analysis room. And I remember we were pretty upset here. And then about five minutes after we were upset, Rochelle checkmated and took all our opponent's pieces. So we were like, all right. She made up for it by playing better than we would have. If I was black, I would play f4 and I would win because I would have an attack on the king's side and my opponent's bishop on h2 would be trapped. But Rochelle wanted to open it up and that's, that doesn't make a lot of sense because then white's pieces aren't all trapped. So definitely f4 and then h5 and g4 and knight g6 and move your arms like this. The thing is, Rochelle's arms are pretty small, 10-year-old girl, so this is not too impressive. Yeah, so that's why if I did it, then, you know, rawr. So I don't like this move taking on e4, although I will admit I still prefer black because black has the open f file, black has the open diagonal for a bishop, black has f4 and f5 for her knights, so I, I still prefer black pieces here. But I don't like this, this trade and neither did John. Okay, so black's better now, but maybe less better than she was. And this is one of the issues that we usually have with the children is they like when it's open. They like to do stuff. And we're old, we don't like to do nothing. Like even going to the analysis room was a chore. It was like on the top floor. Don't want me to push the elevator button and wait for like a minute? So, you know, doing nothing, that's my specialty. You can ask any of my wives, okay? Even the ones I didn't marry, okay? And you can ask these people here, but they're too lazy to answer. They're like, I don't know. No, we're not. All right, what? Okay, so queen f6, rawr, attack. And again, irrespective of whether black's attack will work, there's something else in chess. That's what is your opponent doing? And if somebody can tell me what white's doing, I'll, I'll listen. White's bishop on h2 is terrible. The knight on f3 doesn't have a good square. White doesn't have any queenside attack. And a lot of king's indians... When black is doing this, white's playing b4, c5, knight c4, and breaking through on the queen side. I don't, I don't see that here. So black's having all the fun. Okay, the knight went to e7, opening up for the black pieces, and black can play g4, and stopping white from trading more pieces later. Bishop g3, now that the knight's not on f5, I don't think I would have done that. And she plays c6. Again, not a move I probably would have even thought of. I'd be thinking, how do I mate my opponent? And I'd be having my head tilted over to the king's side. But Rochelle's a very aggressive, active player. She wants to win on all sides of the board and put a lot of pressure on her opponent. And this reminds me of a funny story. Hopefully it's 20 minutes long, and then you can edit it out. Um, it's about two minutes long. I played somebody rated about 1,600 when I was about 2,200, and the game was a really long, boring draw. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was higher rated than me, and I said, well, how did I not beat this 1,600? Like, what, what? I didn't blunder. So like, they should blunder. That's their job. And he said, you didn't do anything. You didn't give them any decisions to make or put any pressure on them. So they just made random moves. You made random moves, and it was a draw. And, and he was right. Sometimes. I'll make bad moves like I did yesterday against Danny Machuca, or as you guys at home would say two weeks ago, if, if I'm lucky, three weeks ago maybe. And I mean, I could be divorced by the time this video is shown. This is, that's like 50-50. Okay, so uh, what was I saying? Let's see, Mary, divorce. divorce, third time lucky. Let's see, Danny Machuca, uh, Starbucks, let's see. Where was I? Oh, yeah. So sometimes when you put pressure on your opponent and your moves are wrong, you win pretty quickly, as we saw Topolov in the first round of the showdown against Caruana. 
One person nodded, but they're just nodding, pretending, pretending like they know what I'm talking about. They know what I'm talking about. Okay, and I remember the comments here were like, what's Topolov doing? And then Topolov won easily. So that's what he was doing. And so even though I don't like taking on e4 or c6, by putting pressure on white, white has to make some decisions. And when your opponent has to make decisions, they're going to be the wrong decision. For example, you at home, you had to make a decision uh, on the day that we voted, and you made the wrong decision. If you just stayed home, then everything would have been fine. But instead you're like, oh, I have an idea. I'll vote for Donald. Wow, <laughs> really showing your intelligence. Good job. Okay, so now look what you got. The CEO of Hardee's is going to run our country soon. Okay, so if he can win a wrestling match with Linda McMahon. All right, so what was I saying? She's an idiot. You're an idiot at home. Okay, so C6, maybe not the right move of putting pressure on your opponent. Now, as I was saying earlier, my game with Danny Machuca, I made four or five blunders. But those blunders made it difficult for him to find the right moves. If he was a computer, he would be salivating, it would go into his circuitry, and I would have won. But since he was a human, he was like, hmm, that move's hard to meet. I think I'll hang mate in one. And then I won. Okay? So I actually won in 19 moves, and I made four really bad moves. If I had made no bad moves, I would have won like 30 moves. So it's a good thing I blundered. Okay, so C6, I don't like it, but I like it later. Then, then I changed my mind. Okay, H4. Now this follows my rule, put it in H. But you, no. Okay, don't move pawns in front of your king. And white played H3 and then H4. This must be why white played H3, a bishop G3, last move. Now, black should be checkmating white, and white should be breaking through on the queen's side. Instead, the players are confusing me because they're 10 years old, they're lower rated, they're very active players, and I like to do nothing. C6 and H4, I've never played such moves. Well, when I was 10, I did. Man, I lost a lot when I was 10. Okay, so knight f5, or as I like to say, knife f5, knife f5. There's, a, there's a good player. You must have beat Nick Carlo in a blitz game a few weeks ago. Yeah, because knife f5. Now, here's one you don't know. You at home can try to answer. Who's the first person who said knife f5 and I stole it from them? It was in 1984 in Moscow. Anybody? A Greek grandmaster. No, nothing? Yeah, exactly. Vasilius Katronius. He said, Ben, it's not knight f5, it's knife f5. Now, he meant with white, because when white gets a knight on f5, then that knight on f5 is pretty good too, I must admit. But that's not what he meant, but I'm going to steal it anyway. So I don't like h4 because knight f5 attacks all that stuff. Okay? And obviously, black's got a lot of stuff over here. We got a lot of pieces. And white doesn't, eh, white's rooks, no good. Queen's hiding. Okay, knight on f3 can't move anywhere. Boo. Okay, so hg, hg, opening up the h file, just what white wants. Pause. Not. So h4 and trading on the h-file. Who did that help the h-file opening? I'll tell you in five moves when white gets checkmated on the h-file. Is white's rook and queen coming to the h-file? As we say in German, Nine. Ish don't think so. Okay, black's queen and rook going to the h-file. Opening the h-file in the king's Indian when white's doing it intentionally? What is this, the world girl's under 10? Oh, wait a minute, never mind. Okay, so Rochelle's pretty happy because she's getting helped with her attack. Bishop back to h2. G4. Yeah, if I was white, I would resign, even if my opponent was like 1,200, just to show the proper etiquette. I'm just kidding. Okay, if my opponent was 1,200, they would resign here with black, right here. Okay, knight D2, the knight's attacked. Knight D4, queen D3, bishop H6, knight B3, king G7. Now, I already told you the answer, but it was like one minute ago, so I have no faith in you. Why did black play king g7? Get the rook over to the h file and then put it in h. White put it in h, now black's going to put it in h. But black's not kidding. White was just kidding. And when black plays rook h8 and either queen h4 or queen h6, then it's not good. Remember, there's good and there's not good. That's not good. Knight a5, because that's very important. See? That's where all the play of the game is. No, yeah. 
All right, talk about misunderstanding the situation. Rook H8, and Knight takes B7, and Black resigned because she's down a pawn. Okay, so remember, when you're playing me, if you can play Knight D2 to B3 to A5, B7, make sure you do that when I'm mating you. Okay, good job. Okay, Bishop F4, even the class can see the threat. There's too many threats. Rook H2, Bishop H2. Computer probably wouldn't do either one of those. Queen H4 might be even better. Man. Nah, Bishop H2 is the best move. Bishop H2 is made in four or five. Okay, so Bishop G3, stopping Bishop H2. And obviously, you tell him, Claudia. What? Yeah, yeah, Queen H6. And as I like to say, the truth hurts. Yeah. So white played bishop g3, bishop h2, bishop g3, bishop h2, bishop g3, and opened the h-file on purpose and somehow got mated. So as we were looking at the game, we were like, Rochelle, why'd you do this? And why'd you do that? And then we were like, good job. Yeah. So Rochelle tried to open the game, gave white a lot of complicated decisions. White's decisions weren't very good. h4 was a terrible decision. Knight b3 to a5 to b7 was crazy, and black just checkmated white easily. And that's one of the reasons she won the world championship. Now, before I show you one of her better games in the tournament, I want to show you the game, well, I mean, I want to leave forever. Okay? I want to show you the game where she actually won the tournament. This was the last game, and this is a very nice tactic. So as you can see, black is winning. Okay, you don't need an advanced degree in hyperbolic topology to realize black's winning, although it would help. Okay, and white is basically in stalemate. You can tell this was some kind of King's Indian too. In fact, she also played knight fd7 this game and then pushed all her pawns. Okay, here white defends it a little better, but black's pawn on e2 is pretty good. And also black's rooks are good and queen is good and up a pawn and there's more advantages, but it's only an hour class. Okay, now white wanted to trade everything off and get her king to the center and win the e-pawn. So she played the obvious queen g1. And her idea was if black trades queens, the king goes to g1, the king goes to f2, and if you win the e2-pawn, there should be a draw. Very reasonable. And if you don't win the e2-pawn, you're just going to lose. So queen g1 is a reasonable move. It's the only way white could ever win the e-pawn. In this position, I don't even see legal moose for white. Horrible. Okay, so I like queen g1. And now, Rochelle calculated all the way to the end, winning all of white's pieces. If, if you can do that, you should do that. Okay, that's one of the advantages of being a very strong junior player. That's what they're good at. They're good at calculating forcing variations where you resign at the end. And usually, not so good at other parts of the game, Although if you're a world champion, usually you're good at everything. So who in the audience could tell me the absolute forced win for black? And actually, one of the reasons I like this, since I'm so old, it reminds me of a game that I played. I've played a lot of games, and it always reminds me of something. Several years ago in the Spice Cup, and I've lectured about this game, I was playing Dean Polito, the Dean of American Chess. And I was a rook down, playing my usual you know, solid game. And I had several passed pawns, and he was winning, then he was drawing, and when he was drawing, he decided he didn't want to draw, and he played a forced win. Unfortunately, it was a forced win for me, and I won the game. And the way that I won was the same way Rochelle won this game, so I, I like that. Although Rochelle, unlike me, isn't down a rook. But she does have a passed pawn on e2, which I did have. So, so how does black win? You've all, I've been talking a long time to give you guys a chance to solve it. Anyone? John? No, nobody. Claudio? Okay, trade queens and rip to d1. And now, if it was black's turn to move, which it's not, what would black do? Take on c1, take on c1, rip d1 check. So white played king f2. It's the same, right. And take on c1 and rip d1. Yeah, in fact, w when I played... Dean, he had his rooks on the back rank, and I took on b1, I think, and then I played d2, and I had passed pawns on e2 and d2, 
and neither one was attacked, so that wasn't good. If I had taken his other rook, I would have lost because his king would have come forward. So I like taking the rook over there and then winning. And after rook d1, obviously the game's over. White resigned and black was the world champion. This was how she finished the tournament. But I like the way she's strategically winning and then here just finds a forced win because another move that looks good is queen g3 check. And then after king h1, white is in stalemate. White can't move anything. And that's what probably a lot of grandmasters would do is keep you know, squeezing the vice and making sure you couldn't move, but younger players and computers just calculate the forced win. Okay? And I'm old, so I can't do that. I miscalculate, lose my e-pawn, and I lose. So I like, I like this really nice calculation, rook takes c1. If you don't see rook c1, rook d1, you, you can't play queen d1, or queen g1. Just like in the Carlson game, you can't play rook c8 check unless you see queen h6. It wasn't like king h7, didn't see that. Oh, I'm lucky I have queen h6. Okay. When he played rook c8 check in the final game, he saw queen h6 before he played it. Um, and again, that's what a computer does. It plays the quickest way to win, not the easiest. Most humans play the easiest way to win. But I guess if it makes you the world champion, you might as well meet your opponent. Yeah. Okay, and last but not least, but least, was this end game that she won. And I really like this game because unlike most 10-year-old girls, she played a very sharp Grunfeld. And this is just her style. Uh, some people, some would call them sexist, say that, you know, girls are afraid when they play, like Emily Trask, don't want, you know, like, no, that's attacking, I don't want to calculate. But in fact, at the World Championship and the higher rated players, all the young players are super aggressive, super. Like Emily Trask, that's right. No, I meant in chess, not in real life. Okay, and uh, stereotyping young and old players now, that, that don't work. You take somebody like Victor Korshnoi, I mean, he died uh, several months ago, but he's still a favorite against most of you. Okay, and when he played chess, even in his, in his 80s and late 70s, he was tough. And he would beat you all kinds of ways. And Carissa Yip is a good example of a young girl who likes to play very sharp, out-calculate you, trick you, run you over, basically. And, well, that's what we have here with Rochelle Wu. She's younger than Carissa Yip and slightly lower rated, but very, very similar style. Like, run over your opponent, give them decisions to make, and they make the wrong decision. And that's the way Rochelle plays. And she plays the Grunfeld by transposition. And here we got white could play e4, which would be a more normal Grunfeld. Okay, and here we have like a asymmetrical pawn structure, which, I mean, for players under 2200, it's very hard to play white. It's not clear what to do. White was given the center, but black's going to keep attacking it. Bishop a3, queen a5, very aggressive already. Bishop e6, and you can see white's retreating. And black has all of her pieces developed and has castled. White has all of her pieces developed but hasn't castled yet. And you can see when there's a bishop that's being kettoed on the same diagonal as a queen and rook, advantage bishop. Okay, and also c3 is weak. Black's pieces are all great. So big advantage to black already. Castles, b5. Again, b5, not the kind of move I would expect from a young player who's afraid of their opponent, I would expect it from a wild and crazy player, like Steve Martin. Okay, so obviously if queen takes b5, the bishop on a3 is hanging, and if bishop takes b5, rook b8, either one pins the bishop to the queen, but b5 is a very aggressive move. Is black gonna leave the pawn on b5 forever? Is black gonna play c4? Is black gonna play b4? And black has the initiative, white's bishop on a3 is trapped. So very bad position for white already. H3, is this the previous game where the knight went to A5? What does H3 have to do with anything? Rook A, B8, Queen C1 getting off of the bishop on G7 and the rook on B8, a very passive move. And sometimes when I'm playing badly or I have a bad result and I look at my game, I can actually look at my own moves and not look at my opponents. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I played queen b3, queen b2, queen c1. That's what I wanted to do. 
Okay, and you look at Black's moves, all very natural, going forward, gaining space. And when White played bishop a3, her intention was to put pressure here, but that didn't happen. Like, White didn't do anything. Rook c8, great position for Black. Bishop retreats again and takes on d4. It's hard for that White queen to escape the Black rooks. Knight b6, all kinds of good squares for Black. Uh, just a great game. If you play the Grunfeld or Grunfeld-like systems, this is what you dream of as black. Uh, it's a nightmare. We have a very famous chess coach of E. Friedman walking in. Yeah. What do you think, white or black? Yeah, are you surprised that white's queens made a lot of moves? Yeah. You're like, wait a minute, didn't white just play queen c1? No. Queen b3, queen b2, queen c1. Bishop a3, bishop b2. Yeah. Okay, now the game is over soon as far as Aviva and I are concerned, but it's a junior tournament, so we play on until we can't play anymore, which I also do. Okay, queen d2, because she didn't move the queen enough. Knight c4. Black has the two bishops and the better position and better everything. The rooks attacked on b8, something I would miss. Queen c7. And very good endgame for black because the two bishops, the weak pawns, the bad bishop on b2, this bishop's great, this bishop's great, and no active plan for, for white. But it's a kid's tournament, so attack a bishop. Bishop to d5, rook e1. And after knight e4, she played b4. And now white blundered, although this is no fun. When I say blundered, I think the computer said like black's up 1.6, and after the next move it's up like three, because it's a blunder. It's a tactical mistake that she made. And this is the kind of move white's been dreaming about for the last few moves, and finally she gets to do it when it's not possible. But did it anyway, okay? She played knight c5. The knight's great on c5 and threatened knight a6 and it blocks the rook on c7, wow, what a move. So when your opponent lets you play a move like that, you might want to be suspicious. We have grumblings from the highest rated player in the room. What are you grumbling about? What's gonna happen? Yeah, the truth hurts, yeah. Yeah, when your opponent can make captures and you're like, oh yeah, then you, yeah. And I was saying the whole lecture, wow, what a great bishop on g7, and you were thinking, what is he talking about? That bishop's not doing anything. Okay, but now, as Claudio mentioned, now that bishop's pretty good. Yeah. So as soon as white got one active piece, then white had to resign immediately. Now, of course, Aviva and I would resign, and then we would go to the good Georgian place. Maybe, probably would take a cab. What, $2? Yeah. Then we'd order everything and get somebody else to pay. Yeah, that sounds like what we would do. Yeah. Okay, instead... Juniors, so you got to play on forever. Okay, rawr. Now it looks like you're going to lose a rook, but juniors are tricky. See? Saving everything. Okay, although two bishops is better than a rook. If you weren't sure, you're going to find out. I remember one, this gives me good memories. Many years ago in the Netherlands, I had two bishops against a rook. Wow, was that fun. Not for my opponent. Man, my bishops are great. Okay, so two bishops versus a rook. And again, resigning is always the correct move, but it's more fun when they don't resign. Then you get to get lots of queens and win the rook and all kinds of good stuff. Okay, and basically white can't do anything. And the truth hurts. And then kept playing, very suspicious, yeah. Okay. So a very brutal win, and played till mate. Yeah, there's no, well, probably White saw the game Kasparov versus Kirill Georgiev. Was that the game I'm making for? Let's see, am I making fun of the right person? That's right, yeah? Yeah, so it was a blitz tournament. Kasparov had a queen and a bishop against a king, and he stalemated him. So if Kasparov came in with a queen and bishop, you probably shouldn't resign. Also, there's the famous game Ario Levy, Ben Feingold. Ario Levy is about 2180 Michigan expert. Sometimes he's a master, usually an expert. And he had queen and bishop against my king, and he also still made me in a slow game. And then he was not happy afterwards. 
I can't tell you at home what he did because it's G-rated. I'm always G-rated. All right. And then King F4, double X clam. I would have played King H6, I'm professional. King safe run H6. Aviv's like, mm hmm. And the point of King H6 is you're in Wang Chung or King F4. White has one legal move. Yeah, anybody see it? They're like, nope. Where? Yeah, King A2 and then mate. Yeah, I would have played King H6 because safer. Although the clock's on your right usually, so King F4 does make more sense. Yeah, because you get to one motion. All right, so that was a brilliant game. I think that was her best game of the tournament. Black in a Grunfeld type game and just rolled over her opponent. The other game was more fun because she was black in a King's Indian checkmated her opponent. But this seemed more like outplaying your opponent strategically and then tactically finishing the game off. And of course, the position that I showed from the tournament, I only showed because she won the tournament. That made her the world champion. So very impressive. And as you notice, because I told you, every game wins with black. Almost all of her draws are with white. Because she's always playing fighting chess. That's how you win these Swiss tournaments. And I think the Americans have a small advantage over the Europeans in the world youth. Because in a lot of tournaments in Europe, like the London Chess Classic starting tomorrow, or for you at home ended last month, uh, you know, if you get like one win and, and eight draws, you're clear first by a wide margin. Okay? No, that wasn't funny to anybody? Okay. But in the world's youth, if you have one win and eight draws, then, you know, you came in 27th. So in the Swiss tournaments with lots of players, you got to win, 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 win. Okay? You can't be like, oh, I'll draw five games and win two. Then I come in first. Okay? Which in some Super GM tournaments is the truth. So... In a lot of European tournaments where the players are all good and it's one round a day, you want to have like two wins and seven draws or three wins and six draws, Makoveyev style. But if you're playing in tournaments like this where you have to get nine and a half out of 11 to win, you have to win with black and white and you have a very active style, King's Indian, Grunfeld type openings, not Queen's Gambit decline, not the Berlin, okay, no draws. And so in the world youth, we see a lot of decisive games and people playing actively. And that's what the spectators want to see. We don't want to, London Chess Classic, wait, I want to see that. Man, you guys all know the results at home. I don't know nothing. They're so smart. All right. So hopefully it's uh, not December 19th yet, so we don't know who the president is. But, you know, we'll find out. All right. And now, as with any good lecture ending, it ends with the important sentence, time to get Thai food. <laughs>